Hey there, and thank you so much for joining us on this live video about how to make home learning more playful. Uh, my name is Matt Miller. I'm the author of Ditch That Textbook and one of the folks that are the creators of online learning ideas where we're helping educators make sense of online learning. And today I am super, super pumped to get to talk to you and to talk about this topic that I think is super important, um, how to make home learning more playful. You know, um, so many of us are trying to deal with the idea of remote learning, online learning, distance learning, whatever you want to call it. And it's so easy for that kind of learning to feel like kind of like a drag, you know, like um, it's easy to get into a rut of let's assign some assignments, let's have kids answer questions and let's turn it in. And there's not a whole lot of play involved in that. And when we do it that way, we're really missing out on an opportunity, I think, to um, to help students to learn at their best potential and to really enjoy what they're doing too. So um, that's the conversation that we're going to be having here. If you're joining us live, as I can see several of you are, um, welcome. Would love to see you check in in the comments. I'm going to write, hey, everyone in the comments right here. And if, um, if you're checking in live, would love to see who you are, where you're from, what you're doing, that kind of thing. Um, and while you all are checking in, Actually, before that, let me say, if you're watching this on the replay, welcome. Super glad to have you here, and thanks for joining us. Um, and while everyone is checking in here, I'd like to bring on our uh, our guests. And so we've got two of them right here with us. So we've got Jed Dearyberry and Julie Jones, Dr. Julie Jones, uh, the co-authors of this great book, which I can show you the cover of real quick. This is The Playful Classroom. This is something that is coming up. They're gonna be publishing it very soon. The cover is gorgeous, by the way. And they're gonna tell us a little bit about the, the fun story behind that cover. Um, and so that's coming out. You can actually find it on Amazon right now if you wanna check it out. And so um, let's do introductions real quick. Um, Jed, would you like to start and tell everybody who you are and what you do? Yeah, I would love to tell you. So my name is Jed Derryberry. I'm an educator in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I've been at this for about 18 years. The first 13 years I was in early childhood education, and since then I've moved into professional development and adjunct work at higher ed. I do lots of arts integration fun. You may see the um, art poster behind me. You see a lamp with a face behind me and all kinds of fun things I've been creating um, in the quarantine time to keep myself um, active and engaged, not thinking about the outside world too much here lately. Um, and and as you said, I'm a co-author of The Playable Classroom with my great friend, Dr. Julie Jones. Julie, tell us about yourself. Oh, okay. Well, I am um, a professor at Converse College, which is an all women's institution in Spartanburg. So Jed and I live in the same town. Um, we in fact just voted this semester, this uh, calendar year to start not just being an all women's institution, but being open to males and females uh, in the fall of 2021. So that's, that's big news. I'm used to saying an all women's institution, but I gotta get used to, to saying for everyone. Anyway, I am the director of student teaching and I direct our early childhood programs. Um, which basically means I get to train teachers in how to play and how to love their job. I and mean, they already love the children, but that's, it's really just such a privilege to get to do what I do. And Jed um, at one point was an adjunct for Converse and that is how we met um, working together that way. So I can't even remember the year. Jed, do you remember when we actually met five uh, years ago? I think, I think that um, it's, five years, like maybe in the next, actually, I think we missed our anniversary. I think it was during the quarantine. <laughs> Happy friend anniversary. Yeah. yeah. I think it's five years. We, we worked on the book for four years. Um, That's true. So I think it took us a year to get going. So I think it's been five yeah. years. That's so, true. um, Let's let's turn turn our conversation to this book. Actually, before we turn to the book, I want to turn to the T-shirts real quick because Jed and I have matching T-shirts. We didn't even set this up, but it shouldn't be a surprise. This I is uh, Jed's little slogan here. 
there's you'll have to ask him some other time about the song that goes along yeah. with this. Hey, um, let me it, let me. I hate to interrupt this flow, but let me just tell everybody: if I suddenly disappear um, and you hear a loud bang, um, there are literally nuts and bolts falling out of my chair as I'm sitting in it. I'm, I may end up on the floor before this is over. With. <laughs> wow, this is mutsy TV here, folks. So, um, so uh, I don't know. I just real if quick. Anything happens. You, you carry on. The show must go on. All right. Sounds good. So real quick, as we dive into our conversation, I wanted to get real fast the uh, story about the cover, which I just displayed on the screen again, oh. real, real quick. Um, Jed, would you tell us the short version of how this beautiful cover came to exist? Well, the short version would be um, four years ago, I became friends with the fantastic, amazing Peter H. Reynolds, author of The Dot and illustrator of countless and author of countless books, uh, children's books. Um, and he is the one who illustrated our cover for us. And we were thrilled about it. Julie and I cried when he said he wanted to do it. Um, and we're just elated that his artwork will forever be associated with our book. We're thrilled about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. For good reason too. So, um, we've had several people check in to say hello. So, um, wanted to say hello real quick. There's Rebecca from Delaware. We've got Helen from Northern Alberta. We've got Tana from Texas. We've got Angela from Hanson Fishing Lake. I don't know where that is, but I could go for some fishing right now. Um, I there's you. I love, I love Tana from Texas. That would be like, that's like, that's like a song I want to write or a little, that's a book I want to read. Like Stephanie, mm -hmm. Stephanie wants an accent like we've got, Jen. I yeah, know. yeah, we've got Brandy from yeah, South Carolina. Carolina. You, be born here, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot hear me. Oh my goodness. Hey, we're gonna say, say, Stephanie, in our book, um, we wrote the book oh, yeah. with lots of um, playful Southern, um, Southern, um, Southernisms uh, mm -hmm. that you will love. So hopefully now that you've heard us and you read the book, you will hear us reading it. And don't worry though, there's a glossary of terms in the back for a translation. Um, yeah. <laughs> you need help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, we've checked in a little bit with some of the folks that are watching. And so now we're gonna get right to our main topic, which is this, how to make home learning more playful. Um, and we've got the authors of the book right here. Um, you know, obviously when they wrote this book, they did, they had no idea that, you know, um, all of these school closures were coming and how relevant this would be to yeah, a lot no of the things that we're doing. But, um, yeah, this is, this is definitely something that I think a lot of us could really use. So let's just dive right into it. Um, uh, we, we wanted to talk just a little bit here at the beginning about the science behind this. And if you came here for practical ideas, don't worry, you're going to get a whole bunch of those. But we want to make sure that what we're doing here is not just a bunch of, you know, silliness and fluff and um, that it's sort of ineffective because it's not. There's a there's a lot of research behind the um, the use of play in the classroom. Right, Julie? That is correct. Um, Jen and I have been interested in play and playful learning for as long as we've been teaching. I mean, as kids too, but part of our professional development is attending the play conference, which is hosted by Clemson University every um, every year. And actually right now, if you go to their website, you can join in on the virtual play conference, um, which is going on. It was supposed to be this week, but um, because of all of the, 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 coronavirus and all the things that were going on right now, it's virtual. So at that play conference, we were able to make friends with several um, several people. So one of those people is Anthony DeBenedet, which wrote, um, he wrote The Playful Intelligence. Um, and that book, while Jed and I were already writing this book, The Playful Classroom, which it, it was, you know how when you write a book, it's, it's just this uh, like this lump of clay, um, it, it morphed into what is the playful classroom over time. And so Anthony de Benedict and his work had a lot to do with that. But in his book, he explains playful intelligence. And what we have done is take that concept. He's a medical doctor, by the way, up north. So um, thoughts and prayers to all of our healthcare workers. Um, we've taken his 
tidbits and applied them to the classroom. So a lot of that has to do with the, the neuroscience and the way the brain works, which not to get, I don't want to get too heady because I mean, we could go down a rabbit hole with that, but it's just so exciting how, when we are playing the, if, if you think about where things are located in your brain, we're talking about the back and the bottom. Those are the receptors for joy and, and, um, and entertainment and, and ha positive experiences. So when we are experiencing things that make us happy, which play is one of those, right? And, and all kinds of play, doesn't matter, doesn't have to be you know, sports. There's, we can get into all the different types of play in just a second. But that sends a signal from the back of your brain up to the front where a lot of our, um, our mental capacities, our decision making, our problem solving and all of that happens. So this gets me so excited. So when you think about neurons firing and forming connections, what you're doing. Oh, my gosh, I almost have to draw you a picture. Can I draw a picture, Matt? Can I do that? Yeah, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so here's here's my notebook. So if you've got a, a neuron. Oh, this is going to be a quick and terrible neuron. Um, you see how you have um, the main parts of it and then these branch out. These are dendrites. OK, so if I want to connect to another neuron, so I've got one in the back of my head and one in the front of my head. Just I mean, there's thousands of them, but just pretend. OK, and then I've got my other neuron and it's firing. OK, y'all don't look at this artwork. First. So they're firing together and they're connecting this connection right here is made thicker and thicker and thicker the more they fire together. So if we're learning something, think front of the brain, and we are experiencing joy, think back of the brain, and they're connecting. That myelin sheath, and I don't know if I'm saying that word correctly, that's just how I read it in my head when I read neuroscience, it gets thick and fatty. And we want the myelin sheath to be thick and fatty because it is, keeps the distractions away. You know how if you are doing something and you're so in the moment and you're in flow, um, somebody could be asking you a question or, or you know, the jet could be falling out of a chair right now and we wouldn't even know it because I'm in the flow of explaining neuroscience to you, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the thick and fatty keeps the distractions mm -hmm. out and that's how you get in the flow. So you just think about how as teachers, how can we combine Playful experiences, positive, back of the brain, right? Endorphins going up to the front of the brain, forming those connections. How can we do that with remote learning? And it, it is absolutely possible. Yeah, and that's exactly what we want to try to dig into in in this uh, video. And so I think it's time for some examples. Um, yeah. Jed, you were just telling us uh, before we came on the video that there is a variety of things all around you that are examples of things that can help make learning more playful uh, that we can even do with our students or have our students do at their homes, right? Very, very much so. Now, I realize that everybody who's watching probably has access to different materials at their house. Um, but one thing that I know everybody has right now is um, some trash, right? We've been staying at home. We've been cooking at home. Um, I have, I left the house today for the first time since March the 17th, just to go ride around the neighborhood. So, but the trash is definitely building up. And what I mean by trash is recyclable material, cardboard boxes, um, your cereal boxes, your containers that your um, uh, butter comes in, or what? Uh, what other uh, toilet paper rolls? I hope those hope those are uh, around your house, um, Matt. If I can, I'm going to move my computer and show them my own little maker space full of recycled things um, that we have here. I've got oh, a wow. whole stash here of stuff. Yeah, I'm keeping it right in my living room because guess what? Nobody's visiting right now, so I don't care if they. <laughs> Um, but look, I've got I've got uh, paper towel rolls. Um, I've got a cereal box. Um, I've been keeping um, this little thing came out of a, a marker that I use for an art project. That's the lid to the mark, uh, a little inside piece of the marker. Um, I've got tons of things down in here. Um, there's a few wine corks down here. <laughs> there are some little wooden stir sticks. Oh, this right here was a container that chicken salad came in from the grocery store. We emptied that out. Um, and what I'm doing with that is I'm using that to create different things um, each and every day on my Facebook page. I've been going live since our first day of school um, outage here. Uh, March 17th, I think, was the first day. 
uh, March 17th or 16th, somewhere in there, around in there. Um, but every day I've been reading um, stories aloud and then inviting kids to create based on the story. So if you're at home mm. and you've got um, access to books, you can use those for the same way. If you don't have access to books, almost every children's book you can think of is online somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to get a paid account, to, there's several um, online subscription services where you can uh, watch the books. But then ask your kids to create something based on the story. I'll give you an example. And this is a sneak peek to a story that's coming up. I haven't done on my Facebook page, but I'm going to read the book, The Queen's Hat. It's by author Steve Antony. And this is such a funny little book about uh, the Queen of England and how her hat that she wears uh, gets blown away. And, and I, I threw my hat, my hat. Now, I will tell you, I have a lot of costumes, Matt. I know you're shocked, but I have lots of costumes. I'm <laughs> a Disney fan. And so I have lots of Disney hats that I am just going to include when I read this book, like this one right here, Fozzie Bear. Now, I could read a book like this, or I could read a book like this. Which one's more playful, Matt? Hmm. Hmm. I think Fozzie Bear is always more playful. Fozzie Bear. What about this guy? Do you know who this is? Do you recognize oh, this guy? Is that Lotso from Toy Story? It is. It's Lotso from it Toy is. Story. I look kind of cute in this hat, don't I? I like it. Um, you could read a book with that. Look at this one that I had in around. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. Okay. I know that you have some hats somewhere around your house. It doesn't have to be these kind of hats. And here's the best part. You got all that recycled material. You could make your own silly hat. There's no wrong way to do it. That's the best part about playful learning is the process and the experience, not necessarily the outcome that we're looking, uh, the final product that we're looking for. Um, with all those rec recycled materials with a cereal box, you can bend that cardboard and make it fit to your head just right. Um, I have a big head, so I might need two cereal boxes. Um, but that's just a quick way. An another thing that I start looking for things around your house and rethink and repurpose them. I, I just happen to have these. I know everybody wouldn't have these maybe lying around their house. These are wiggly eyes. OK. And you say, well, what will wiggly eyes do? Well, you could ask students to stick these on an, on an item in the house and let the let the item come to life and then tell a story from its perspective. Um, you may see behind me. See my little lamp that's back there? Um, mm. See that it has eyes and a mouth and, and, and eyebrows? I didn't use wiggly eyes here. Guess what I used? I used cardboard. I just made eyes and stuck them on there. Uh, so you don't have to have these to make that work. You can, you've can. you got your recycle material. Um, another thing that I did very early on is I gathered all the art supplies. I have a home office, um, but it, it doesn't really have a good space to create like I want. It's a place to work at a laptop, but not a good space to create, but I keep all my art materials in there. What I did was I brought all my art materials out to the table. Look at that. Oh my goodness. All of my art materials are out there. Now, I, I also got stacks of children's books. I got my little art mannequin there. Um, and I keep those handy because when I get a good idea, I want to get started. And you may want to talk about this, uh, this artwork behind me here. You see, I had some brown paper that I just stuck up there and you see that there's one long black doodle that kind of makes its way all the way through the page. I've been adding to that as I felt inspired. You see the octopus still needs to be colored there. Um, there's other space to add um, that you may say, well, I don't have any, um, I don't have any um, paper like that. Guess what? You probably got some wrapping paper. Um, oh, I, have, yeah. I have old wrap, I have, um, Birthday paper. I'm not going to any birthday parties anytime soon, so I don't need the paper. Guess what else? I have some Christmas wrapping paper that I got down from the attic. Why not? And it's even better if you got the kind with the grids on the back. Um, you can play tic tac toes. You can the grid lines. You can make do graphing on the back of that. Put it up on your wall. Now I'll tell you. Normally, right there, I have a big picture of the South Carolina flag that hangs on the wall. But I took it down because, again, nobody's coming over to see how fancy my house is decorated right now. So I put it up there. Uh, put that. I took that picture down. Um, you can see. Oh, see it there on the corner. You can see the picture there in the corner, sitting on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, I took it down and um, just added the the doodle to the line. Um, what else? Oh, just can we pause for just a second because I know. I some people... about this all day. Yeah, I interrupt, Julie. 
<laughs> Some of the viewers are probably thinking, oh, that's nice. That's cute. Um, but I don't teach kindergarten. I don't teach first grade. Um, what can I do? And that's the part of the book that we want to make very clear is that this is the power of play for all ages. So it doesn't matter if you teach um, little people or bigger little people we have early childhood elementary. They're just bigger little people. They're taller or middle school or um, college seniors right now. I direct our student teaching. Can you imagine those friends who are just wondering if they're going to graduate because they were not able to go and keep teaching? Um, they're going to be fine. But that concept of play for everybody is is across the board. Um, if you are in the middle school, how can you use the back of uh, wrapping paper to let students showcase what they've learned? Can they use those grid lines to make a big graph um, of an equation? Can they then turn that equation, um, the graph into art? It, there are just so many, so many ideas from that. Um, and another piece that I thought of while Jed was talking, this is how You'll see as you read the book um, that we go back and forth like this and a lot of um, playful arguing happens. So you'll you'll be able to read that um, now with our voices included. Um, mm -hmm. But we have these neurons in our brain called mirror neurons. Um, and I, we refer to it in the book as our brain, Stacey and Clinton um, from Jed. What what show is that from? We had this argument. We're, we're right. not aware. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Remember so, now. Know, yes. Um, but anyway, so mirror neurons is like your brain um, looking and evaluating at what you see. And right now, so much of that, what we see is online content. Um, well, somebody is being playful, like Jed is getting on his Facebook page every weekday at nine o'clock doing these read alouds. Um, we see that playful spirit in him and the mirror neurons in our brain see that we value that we start to imitate that and we start to be more playful with our own children um, with our friends um kind of like when somebody picks up a glass of water off the table you know if they're going to drink that water or if they're cleaning the table you just seem to intuitively know that right do you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's your mirror neurons because you have also picked up a glass of water and your mirror neurons in your head go, oh, wait, I've made that move. I know what's going to happen. Well, now we're watching and experiencing people be playful online. And then therefore the mirror neurons go, hey, look at that playful imaginative spirit you got there. Uh -huh. I want to do that, too. And it's contagious. So um mm -hmm. Like these families doing the um, the TikToks with the songs, you see how it's caught on. It's neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, I've got to share a couple of the comments that have come in here. I was I was asking, you know, what are some things that you've got in your uh, house that you could repurpose? For instance, um, you know, Stephanie threw out that you could totally use coffee pods. Um, really like this one from Beth. Toilet paper roll marshmallows. <laughs> uh, we did that on my read aloud one day. She's, she's been paying attention, right? Yeah. yeah. Barbara says, I have takeaway containers. They would great make great mini salad gardens. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah. Look at what I've made right here. These are, um, the other night we had some pinto beans out of these cans. I washed them up and wrapped them in tape. And now they're cool little marker holders for my mm -hmm. table. So, yeah. Um, nice. That's cool. what I wanted to say about what Julie mentioned about um, it not being just for little kids, but the ideas that I was I was sharing those were those were higher level ideas. Um, writing from a perspective of a lamp in your in your house that <laughs> that's not a kindergarten or first grade experience. That that, that is a, a an upper grade um, experience. Uh, preparing them to read novels that are written from a uh, second or third person point of view. Um, it's a great way to lead into that in a playful learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a question that came in also. Uh, this was also from Beth. And so maybe you can clue people in on what she's talking about here. She asks, do you mention any of the outside of the box challenges in your book? And if you don't, maybe where can people find those? We do. So we do mention we that. In section seven. Say that again, Julie. In section seven. Yeah, section seven is full of, it's nothing but ideas and, and practical ways that you can be playful in your classroom. The destroy the box challenge that Beth is mentioning um, is something that I, we started on Twitter a while back where you would literally take something as simple as a ruler and ask students to think of all the different things they could 
use a ruler for other than measurement or straight line. You know, measuring and straight line, that's its purpose, but it has lots of other possibilities that it could be used for. And so when I say destroy the box, you're thinking, you know, some people say think outside the box, but we want to just get rid of the box altogether. We want to destroy the box so yeah. that there's no limit to our thinking. And if you if you don't get rid of the box, you often get back in it. And that makes your that puts your thinking back into the box. So nice. Nice. Very good. good All right. Thank you. Very. Yes. Yes. I like this. Okay. So we're kind of wrapping up here. We got just a few minutes left. If we wanted to do a couple of quick hits, just like little places where you could see squeezing in a little bit of extra play. I'd love to hear if you, you all have anything. I'm going to kick it over to Julie. I'm going to put her on the spot here and see if she has any, I know. And no is an acceptable answer, Julie. If I put you on the spot too much, that's okay. Cause I'm sure we can pass it to Jed and he'd have other things too. Well, but no, but there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of things that we can do. Um, when you think about asking children, whether they are adult children like us who love to play or um, children like our, who are in the room next to me here um, to show us what they know, let them decide. Um, mm -hmm. They have curiosity. It's innate. It's in all of us. We we're curious we we wonder about things. The, the students in our classrooms, they know all kinds of ways to show you what they know. So if we give them a worksheet with fill in the blank, we're not giving them an opportunity to really be creative and really solve problems. So if, my, if it's two-step algebraic equations, how can I show my teacher that I know that? Can I um, write a play? Can I write a children's book? Can I, can I do something? Can I... Um, I don't know, I have some kind of artwork that showcases whatever the skill is that they're supposed to know, let them decide. Um, yeah. I mean, typically we'll do PBL in the classroom, but there's no thing that says you can't do PBL in remote and online learning. It absolutely mm -hmm. can happen. It happens all the time. Yep. Yep. Love that. Jed, you got another one for us as we wrap up? Well, so I was going to, I was going to say again, um, one of the things that I love to do is I call it taking a walk art side like outside, but art side. And so as you walk around, look for art in nature, look for symmetry, look for fractions, look for um, ways that, that, that nature shows division. Um, look for ways that it shows multiplication and it's all art. And one thing I've been doing um, to, keep, to keep my brain active and engaged the last few weeks is I've been taking a walk around my neighborhood and looking for things that I can create and turn into art. Um, I, can I show you a few things? Have we got a minute to show you a few things? Yes, you sure do. Absolutely. So I'm going to show you just a few quick things that I have turned into art just from walking around the neighborhood. Um, one, in South Carolina, we have a, a tree called a sweet gum maple, and it makes little sweet gum balls. They're little spiky little balls that look like this. And they're usually round, but this one was flat because of a car. I found a couple of them. And then I painted the other side. And now they're little lions. And now I'm looking for more because I want to make a whole set of lions. And then I'm going to make another one, another set look like tigers. And I'm going to make a checkerboard out of nature materials. This is a little piece of wood that I found. And I loved how it was already, it looks kind of like a rainbow. See how it's kind of just shaped like a rainbow, even colored differently. And look, so I painted the other side to make it look like a little rainbow. Then I found this stick. It looked like an alligator, so I painted it and made it an alligator or the Loch Ness Monster. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I painted it. And this is probably my most favorite. Look at this bird I made. A out bird. Look at it. I love it. The stick uh -huh. was playing in the road. These aren't real feathers. This is part of the stick. This is just the way the stick had frayed apart, laying in the road. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's fantastic. Now, I, uh -huh. I went a little extra with this. I painted it. But so much of this was already art in itself that I could have arranged on the ground to spell letters. I could have did, uh, done vocabulary building. Maybe you don't have sidewalk chalk. Um, did you know just taking a plain old piece of quartz and writing on your driveway, it's the same thing. It'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's art all around outside, um, <laughs> out there on the sunny days. <laughs> if you can stand the pollen, the pollen's really bad where we are right now. Ooh, it's rough. Um, yeah. When Jeff's talking about when Jed's talking yeah. about using his imagination, walking around, um, the, the the whole premise of that is 
using your imagination, whether you're reading a book or you're taking a walk and looking for things in nature, that's the basis of what skills are necessary to develop empathy. If we are able to look as we take a walk and reframe what we see into something that we don't see, like this bird that's dancing across the screen here, um, then, then you're exercising those uh, mental muscles for being able to see yourself in someone else's shoes. Those, those don't necessarily happen automatically, but if we need to develop a more empathetic citizenry, it's so hard to say this with birds. Sorry. <laughs> then when it, we, have to, we have to um, allow children to use their imaginations and we have to mm -hmm. encourage it. We have to model it like Jed is doing here. Mm -hmm. um, yes. so that they see, feel look, even, what I'm doing, see, even what I'm doing right now, Matt, though, imagine mm -hmm. if, if, if the assignment was to learn about creating dialogue. I now have yeah. some, I now have a little creature that I can look at and talk to mm -hmm. and pick up that dialogue. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> like you see you see so many assignments out there where they're saying record something to Flipgrid or record a little video of this or that or the other. Why not put a little something like this in it to make it more playful? This has been the best stuff. I wanted to show you all real quick. There's been a little bit of genius in the uh, comments that I had to share with you. Beth oh, yeah. says Julie is right. Getting older kids to be more creative is sometimes harder than with younger kiddos, no. which can be very yeah. true. And then check this follow up that came from Stephanie. She says, Beth, it'd be great to team up older kids with littles. I what love that. Would that be, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Because nothing brings your inner kid like a four year old. If you have yeah. to accept the concept or you have to talk to them, they'll call yeah. you on it really quickly if you're having fun. Yes. Yes. If, if you need yeah. some help, just message me and I'll play along because I'm basically <laughs> a four year old inside. <laughs> that is a true it. statement. All right. Well, we're we're going to have to wrap this up. This has been so good. Um, I wanted to share real quick. If you heard Jed talk about the read alouds or saw it in the comments, I wanted to put a link there where you're able to be able to find those real quick and easy. It's actually, I think it's facebook.com slash Mr. Dairyberry. Is it? Is it? I don't know. I've been telling everybody. I just, I just loaded it as Jed Dairyberry, but uh, maybe let me, it's let me make sure. I think it's... Um, we're going to check real quick. Very, yeah. very, because if it's not, then I've been telling everybody the wrong, you know what? <laughs> it is Jen Derry, Mary. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha I right there. On the wrong page. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so real quick, as we wrap up here, I wanted to tell you one more time, um, this is coming very soon. The Playful Classroom. This is where this whole video was inspired by. So if you haven't checked it out yet, it's available for pre-order on Amazon as of the moment that this is, is going live. If you're seeing this in the future, it may already be out. You may be able to get a copy of it. So you've been getting a bunch of the previews for that, that book right here. Um, Jed Dearyberry, Julie Jones, thank you both so, so much for, for joining us and giving giving us some ideas. Thank, thank you. Matt. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for watching this video and for being a part of it. We're going to have more and more live videos coming. If you're not subscribed to the Ditch That Textbook YouTube channel, that's the easiest place to get notifications about it and to know about it. So my name is Matt Miller. It's good to see you on this video. Thanks so much for joining us.